Hello, and welcome to our lecture on the memoir assignments. So today you will watch this and start drafting your uh, journal in response to what is it that you'd like to write in your uh, memoir sociological lens assignment. So the PowerPoint slides that are accompanying this lecture are available under course documents. The sociological lens memoir is a cumulative assignment that asks you to bring together the ideas that we had learned and considered and imbibed in this uh, course. So it's, it very much is designed as a cumulative assignment. And the context is that um, you're asked to take all the different ideas, theories, and lenses um, through the sociological field and turn them upon yourself. So we learned right from the first week that C. Wright Mills described the process of sociological imagination as an ability to see you, yourself, your place in society beyond your own mind and your own sense of self. So we've looked at the broader uh, perspective um, on the kind of conditions that shape us, uh, so socialization and how through socialization, through cultural contexts, we can uh, observe cultural bias. We can see gender differences, uh, racial, religious, sexual, or employment discrimination. And we also considered how there are positive examples of socialization and how certain individuals are more empowered than others due to certain aspects of their uh, upbringing and what we said is the uh, the broader context of intersectionality and what it means to be uh, of a particular ethnicity, race or color or um, a cultural background and how these intersect and how also your sex, your gender, your uh, political uh, identifications and so on and so forth, how this can um, place you on the social spectrum of privilege or lack of privilege. So the task in this assignment, uh, I think is a really exciting one because everything you're learning is useful to your analysis of your position in society and as a professional to your understanding of how to appreciate the differences among people and their experiences so that we don't apply the same comb, the same um, kind of uh, generalizing principle to every individual when we practice social work or teaching or any other profession. So I'm asking you to apply one of the sociology lenses um, that we studied closely, so either functionalism or conflict theory or interactionist theories or the feminist perspective. Okay, so I want you to specifically focus on one more than any other, but you can also rely on the others uh, to some extent. And in a uh, paper of about six pages, roughly 1250 words, I am asking you to choose one lens specifically to apply to your life and your family's life. So um, you can focus on specific elements and not on all of them that we considered in the course, which means that you can really look at race and uh, racial uh, constructs and what we discussed in the previous uh, chapter, the all encompassing kind of uh, generalization that a lot of people um, imbibe with their upbringing about racial differences and then critically apply that to how ethnicity is constructed and how your own experience in the Canadian culture um, has shaped you to think about race and ethnicity. You can also have a stronger emphasis on class um, or the socioeconomic uh, inequalities in our society if that's what you'd like to focus on. And you can bring into this also gender and the difference between compensation between men and women, for example. You can also think about health 
and disability, which we'll discuss uh, next week. And this is something again that um, you're bringing into the assignment um, from a personal perspective. So it has to be that the topic you are focusing on from everything that we had learned actually motivates you to uh, write something that is both personal but really analytical. You're using the sociological imagination to step outside of yourself and consider what it's like to be somebody like you and somebody like you and your family in the, con in the larger context of society. So you can also, of course, consider religion, education, and other forms of socialization. So don't try to cover everything is the biggest advice I can give you. That will mean you are doing too much and you will not be able to say anything very, very focused and uh, specific and detailed and analytical if you try to cover it all. Now, in choosing your lens, you want to think about the kinds of examples in your life that are very important to you and also are interesting from the sociological perspective. So, for example, if you're using the lens of feminism, let's say, you will define the terms of feminist analysis uh, following the course materials, uh, specifically from the textbook and anything that I had taught in lectures on gender construction. And then you will apply it to the lives of your family. So I've given you an example of my Russian upbringing and that I got caught up in the struggle between old fashioned views of women's roles uh, propagated by my father and some other members of the family to say women are not as smart as men. Women have to do a certain amount of household work that men don't have to do. And then the conflict became evident to me through the secondary socialization, so key terms, right? Uh, secondary socialization, in particular in post-secondary education, where I read um, works that exposed me to feminist views on the uh, social inequality between men and women. And this became a struggle within me as a person. So the first step is to really think about what you want to focus on. The second step is to write a journal. Okay, so first I'm asking you before the memoir, to write a journal which will be uh, something that allows you to shape your idea, to frame it in a way that um, gives me a sense of what you'd like to focus upon. And the good thing is I'll give you feedback. So if there's anything that I have concern about in terms of your application of a lens, then I can give you that feedback before you submit the final assignment because the memoir is worth uh, only 5%, sorry, the journal on the memoir is only worth 5%, whereas the final assignment is 20%. So um, please submit your journal, uh, uh, which is the step before the final memoir, no later than November 13th, which is a week from now, which means that I can have some time to give you feedback. And um, the engagement in your journal already has to be very, very analytical. So you have to start really trying to use appropriate vocabulary and terms that we've been studying. Here's a whole long list, and that's not even a quarter of it, um, but just to give you some key terms that I've discussed in lecture in particular, which is uh, binaries, diasporas, double consciousness, cultural capital, class inequality, gendering, and the issue of gender conflict, gender trouble, intersectionality, uh, racism and racialization uh, or racialized um, socialization, social mobility or uh, social upward mobility versus downward mobility, ethnicity, ethnic solidarity, homeland orientation, and there's so much more, right? So I'm expecting you to actively start using these terms. The idea for the journal is that it's a kind of a proposal so that you give me a sense of what you want to do i give you feedback then you write the major assignment now the expectations this is outlined in the document also that gives you the uh, breakdown of the assignment is that you'll have a title for your paper 
You'll have an organizing theme or principle or an argument, which we can call a thesis, and we'll discuss this next week in lecture. And then you also have to really point to examples from our textbook or, and or lectures, and you have to phrase uh, this in your own words, so paraphrasing and citing properly. And all arguments have to be supported with evidence or examples from your own life, and that's key. So I'll give you another example in this lecture. So for 20 marks um, out of 100, you have to include at least 20 different concepts we've studied so far. So remember what I said, all these terms, diasporas, race, racialized, socialization, ethnicity, etc. You have to use 20 to get full marks. Okay. And you also have to obviously cite everything properly and reference at least one external source either I offered to you. We watched some TED Talks. We watched a film uh, in the first week. And um, if you want to find your own article to support your ideas, you're welcome to do that. So, and again, I'll give you an example. Um, here's a list of what not to do in your final assignment. You should not spend all of your five minimum to six pages summarizing what the key terms mean uh, instead of applying them to your life. So if you just give me definitions from textbooks, from the textbooks uh, pages, that's not what we're looking for. Um, I also don't want you to sound like a distant observer who basically is trying to be a, um, an, a kind of uh, outside observer who does not give some personal examples, right? Um, so you want to focus on examples of your own life. And uh, in that sense, you don't want to just drop names, you know, Du Bois, Weber, whoever it is, um, without actually explaining what these sociolo sociological ideas have given us to help us understand our lives a little bit more deeply. Um, also, you must not uh, forget to cite, okay? Please be aware, be aware of uh, plagiarism. So before you submit your final, final memoir, you also, so not the journal, but the final, final assignment, before you submit that, I ask you to complete the academic honesty quiz, which is available already on Blackboard. Now, having said all this, the final um, piece of advice I'd like to share with you is my own um, sociological lens memoir that I composed to give you an example. And this is a draft that I composed in order to say, this is what I want you to do. But if I were to submit it for academic purposes, I would add more terms and more uh, development of the ideas. But for what it's worth, um, in order to give you a sense of what you're being asked to do, here's what I wrote. So if I begin this um, assignment thinking about my identity in the cultural context of Canada, having grown up in Russia, um, I will present a shattered mirror or looking glass self um, to you. So I can call it the cultural shattered looking glass self. Um, and I'll begin by looking through the functionalist perspective, thinking about how my paternal grandmother um, from a very Russian, uh, traditionally Russian ethnic background, um, taught me, uh, and just here's a little image of her. She passed away um, last summer at age 92. So she lived a really long life. And um, she survived World War II and hunger. And actually, in the Russian context of post-World War II, unlike most of people or women specifically around her, um, and she had three sisters and one brother, and she was the eldest, so she raised all her youngest siblings because her father died in World War II. 
she decided not to get married early and she went to school and finished college and became a photographer. And as a photographer, she worked for 40 years and she got married late. And so she only had one child, my father. And she essentially was a kind of progressive woman in that sense because she chose a career over a big family and she only gave up her career when I was born um, to help out with her first grandchild. So in that sense, she's both a progressive woman in my family and someone who also really, really believed in some very, very kind of sexist, I would say, uh, or at least gender divided um, perspectives on life. So when I was really, really young growing up in Russia, I imbibed the values that a woman has to carry to keep the hearth or the fireplace um, or like the warmth of the home from her. And in that sense, there was ethnic identification in my immediate family uh, with traditional gender roles. So, you know, I learned to do the dishes, you know, vacuum the floors and um, bake pies and, you know, be a good hostess and, and a lot more, right? So a very, very traditional kind of perspective on femininity. And so my gender was constructed in a way that was, again, traditional and um, not, not at all in line with feminist perspectives. Um, in Canada, now as a mother, when my daughter a few days ago came home and asked me about the Russian tradition of drinking tea from a little plate, like a saucer, um, she told me she learned this from uh, a teacher at school who is Russian. And she asked me why we do this, right? Instead of uh, drinking tea from a regular teacup, why do we pour it into a little uh, plate? And uh, I, to be honest, didn't have much to say other than my grandmother taught me to do that. Um, I don't do it much anymore, but um, in the Russian culture, uh, this is something that is still a tradition that exists. So I researched it and I explained basically to my daughter that um, this is something that ladies really enjoyed doing, uh, especially um, before the um, modernization of Russia as a status symbol that this, you know, having pretty china, pretty plates and pretty cups was part of um, aesthetic uh, and social status construction. And then also part of my research taught me that um, it, it was astounding for me to learn that the tradition began actually no, no later than the 18th to 19th centuries um, from, east, from the East in, in uh, China in particular, and that the uh, colder parts of Russia like Siberia were known to use saucers like that um, as part of, again, status symbol, aesthetic framing of drinking a hot beverage, which is very useful in the north in the cold. And so I found an article uh, uh, by uh, Firstova from this year that actually taught me this. So you could find a research article that helps you to explain a cultural tradition um, in your own family but that's not necessary. You could re just rely on your textbook. Um, so I considered the preconception or the assumption that I had, which is very colonial, um, that the tea drinking rituals I knew from Russia came from Britain. That's not true. But I realized that India is where the tradition of drinking tea came from to uh, Great Britain and um, that the tea and biscuit tradition is not something that actually is so uh, European. So I realized some of the Eurocentric bias that I held before I did some research. In any case, I also realized uh, additionally from a conflict perspective, um, the conflict lens theory, that the clash between colonizers and the colonized is an important lesson I have to teach to my children. And this is not the first time I realized it, but this was a very simple example about tea drinking. In addition, my grandmother um, 
Praskovia, um, Ivanovna, using the patronymic, very traditional in Russia, was taught, as I mentioned, to respect men above women as smarter, more important. She'd always ask me, does your husband approve of your decision? And I was like, it's my decision. I hope he approves because I'm a person too, anyway. But um, I decided, you know, in thinking about my daughter's questions, that there's a part of what my grandma believed that I do not want to impart on my children. And here's another example of that. In the Canadian context of growing up being labeled Canadian, my Ukrainian heritage makes me very emotionally uh, vulnerable to the kinds of discussions that Russian people have about Russian culture and Russian pride. You know, I mean, my mom jokes mostly, but she says that Russian humor is the funniest and the best. But um, in any case, whatever pride I have in my culture, I don't agree with Russian politics um, since the early 20th century, which have become more and more authoritarian or totalitarian. So Putin, Vladimir Putin's government is both racist and homophobic, and certainly they have anti-Ukrainian sentiments in part because they want to take more land, right? They want to usurp more of the land that they think used to belong to them. Uh, because the historical arguments that these politicians make is that the first uh, capital of Russia uh, was Kiev, which is now the capital of Ukraine. So the really complex conflict that I face as a Russian-Ukrainian-Canadian is that I do not agree with Russian policies and aggression, but I get stereotyped as a Russian-Russian because I grew up in a major city uh, called St. Petersburg, which used to actually be uh, a capital of Russia at one point in our history. So again, despite the ethnic identification and solidarity, um, I feel a lot of conflict about my identity, especially in the Canadian context. And just again, as an, another example of the kind of aggression and violence that people can face out of uh, um, ignorance and stereotyping is that um, I've seen both instances of Russian community uh, members putting up Russian symbols on their car, like the sign of victory, the Second World War victory, which is a little flag or like a ribbon, rather black and orange ribbon that they put on their cars and most cars get vandalized. And similarly, Ukrainian yellow blue flag on uh, Ukrainian cars get vandalized. So this is a problem, obviously. This is discrimination. And um, then the concern as a Canadian citizen who's been here for over well over 20 years is that I really, really uh, want to um, socialize my children to understand that stereotyping skin color or gender or ethnic practices or socioeconomic status is wrong. And we really, really have to be careful how we treat other people based on visible uh, characteristics, you know? So final example, my husband um, is not Russian and uh, he grew up in Canada, but he is from a very um, traditional Latvian family. And his grandparents uh, are spinning in their graves about the fact that he, he married a Russian woman because Russia or the Soviet Union after the World War II colonized Latvia. It was a tiny, still is, very, very tiny, territorially speaking, Baltic country, uh, a bit south of Russia, uh, a little bit east of Ukraine, basically. And after World War II, the Soviet Union took advantage of the territories that were vulnerable and uh, absorbed them into the union of, you know, all people, <laughs> this was the slogan, basically that all people in the Soviet Union are equal, but as a tangent, everybody knew that the Russians were more equal 
than the Latvians, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, etc. Right. Um, and some of the countries that were colonized were Muslim and really had nothing to do with Russian Christianity and so on, but were forced to speak Russian, to not practice their religion openly. Um, so this is similar to the kind of total institution um, practices that we discussed with residential schools in Canada. So the Soviet Union basically tried to make everybody the same, a melting pot. So the Soviet Union was under the rule of Joseph Stalin, and he is known historically as a leader, a Russian um, or Soviet Union leader, who has been compared to Adolf, Ed, uh, excuse me, I can't even say his name, <laughs> Adolf Hitler. You know, may, basically, maybe you don't know the extent um, of the genocide that happened under the rule of Joseph Stalin, but um, there were millions of people um, sent to Siberia and executed, and also um, at least, if not executed, imprisoned and tortured for the sheer fact that they had land, that they were landowners, because the Soviet Union tried to take everything from everybody and redistribute it. But of course, it was never fairly redistributed. So there was no social equality in the Soviet Union. There were social systems that provided a certain extent of universal education and universal health care. Um, but these were not um, systems of equity. Like there was, there's no equality in that system in that sense. And there was always the upper level elite. Um, that uh, benefited from the uh, oppression of the uh, proletariat, right? So the bourgeoisie very much existed in the Soviet Union system, despite the pretense, the myths, the appearances that this was a country of equality. So um, Joseph Stalin's regime, as far as we know, and my family killed at least half of my father's family. and. Um, both then as a feminist thinker, having grown up in Canada, and as someone who knows that my last name is very rare in the world, um, I decided not to take my husband's last name. I kept my original paternal last name. And so this is another point about um, cultural identification and uh, uh, personal identity politics. Naming is really important. So my husband's last name, actually, part of the reason that I didn't take it is that it's not his real last name. When his parents came to Canada to culturally assimilate to the Canadian language uh, or languages, to the way that people see um, privilege and uh, distinction socioeconomically, they decided that their family Latvian nat um, name, the last name, which is Zweigsnit, is too ethnic. And they did not want their kids to be uh, made fun of or discriminated against as too ethnically distinct and maybe from some poor Eastern European family. So they changed their last name. And so to wrap up this uh, thought, the socioeconomic realities of first generation immigrants, which a lot of us are actually, as far as I understand from meeting you guys. Um, so people who came from uh, a family of immigrants, um, even if you're not first generation, but second generation, there's a real difference that I noticed in the Russian community um, in Toronto that resembles kind of 19th century marriage practices you know people still say oh you know you want to marry someone who has a certain amount of money you know and so marriage as an institution of passing down money rather than a romantic um, love practice so the kind of social stratification that we witness in toronto ontario is evident in many different ways to wrap up you know there are ne neighborhoods here um, in Toronto that are uh, below poverty line and the children growing up in these conditions face um, much higher risk of uh, exposure to violence, to domestic violence, 
uh, and other forms of uh, discrimination and hardships, um, then generations of kids who grew up in rich pockets of Toronto, you know, who never have to face this. So this impacts also people's practices, even on the level of education. Um, so uh, there are people I've met in Toronto who have uh, a strong belief that the public education system in Toronto is deeply flawed and all their kids go to private schools. My parents really, you know, didn't have enough money to send me to a private school when I was a kid here in Toronto, but they really wanted to, you know. And uh, there was this Pushkin private Russian school that they really wanted to send me to. And part of my upbringing, because of my athletic background, when I found out they don't have a soccer team or a volleyball team, I said, I don't want to go to that school. I want to go to a regular school where I can play team sports because private schools typically have anything from, you know, horseback riding to fencing or something like that. Anyway, so. So these are, again, social stratification strategies, uh, status symbols. We've discussed this before. Um, we'll talk more about um, family and healthcare topics. So um, I'm not asking you to finalize your approach yet, but please write a good journal that considers what it is that you think is important in the construction of your final assignment, the uh, sociological lens memoir. and um, uh, this week, we don't have a live class, in part because I have a series of doctor's appointments that I have to go to, so I apologize for that. Um, but I really think that here you received a lot of information that you have to ponder. There's no um, extra assignment due. Uh, most of you have completed the um, uh, chapter quiz on chapter 8. and. Um, uh, you have a whole week to complete this journal, which is not worth a lot of marks, but asks you to consider how you will write the final assignment. And that's really, really important. It's a culmination of everything you learned in this class. So um, I really look forward to seeing you uh, next week in our live class. And if you have any uh, personal question that you'd like to uh, discuss, you can always reach out to me by email. Thank you so much and have a Wonderful weekend. Take care.